episode of Critic Reading Writing. My name is Atto Quayson and I am a professor of English at Stanford University. Today's episode will be focused on the Afro-Brazilians of Accra and the ways in which they exemplify the relations between the New World and Africa and also illustrate forms of transnational cosmopolitanism that evades the usual global north circuits with which the two terms are normally defined. A shipload of Afro-Brazilians returned to Accra in 1836, comprising 200 people made up of 70 families. The reasons for their arrival as a group specifically in 1836 and not in previous years will be explored, as were the ways in which they were received in the then pre-colonial Accra and incorporated into the social and cultural life of the Gan, the indigenous denizens of the township. We will see that the Afro-Brazilians introduced various forms of urban skills and livelihoods that were not generally present before their arrival, and that by this means, they helped to further diversify the hybrid cultural formation of Accra that had already been impacted by the rise of the mulatto or mixed race offspring of European men and local women and their consolidation as the bridgehead between Europeans and locals from the 17th century onward. From the purview of modern diaspora studies, there are different categories of diaspora. Among these, we may count victim diasporas, which are defined by two key principles, namely the violent dispersal of a population to at least two other locations, coupled with the interdiction against return to the homeland. These principles are amply illustrated in the Jewish, African-American, and Armenian diasporas, among others. Labor diasporas imply what is conventionally referred to in popular discourse as economic migrants. By the height of empire in the 19th century, these included the indentured labor diasporas of South Asians in East Africa, the Caribbean, and other parts of the world, as well as the many soldiers from outside of Europe that were conscripted to fight wars on its behalf. Then there are also trade diasporas, composed primarily of traders and their families that settle outside of their homelands for purposes of trade and commerce. Chinatowns everywhere illustrate this type of diasporas. Ethno-nationalist diasporas are formed out of dispersed cultural populations that then organize themselves to either seize power back in their homelands or to influence political frameworks and institutions there. The important thing to note is that these diaspora categories are not mutually exclusive, but can be co-constitutive depending on historical configuration. The Afro-Brazilians of Accra would fall under the category of ethnic return diasporas that Takeyuki Tudor discusses in his essay, When Diasporas Return Home ambivalent encounters with the ethnic homeland. Ethnic return diasporas are co-ethnics that return to their homeland for a variety of reasons after sometimes generations long sojourn in the diaspora. While their ethnicity 
may identify them superficially with people in the homeland, the knowledge, experience, and attitudes they cultivated away from home may have altered them so dramatically that they also require lengthy periods of acculturation back into the mores and values of the homeland. The Afro-Brazilians of Accra exemplify many of the elements described by Tudor while also illustrating the success of their integration. Viewers will recall our discussion of urban studies from the perspective of Accra that we had in our previous episode. In chapter two of Oxford Street Accra titled the Afro-Brazilians Tabon of Accra, I moved from a microanalysis of spatial relations to a macroanalysis of urban space, this time taking in not just the larger segmental neighborhood structure of the city as a whole, but also the transnational entanglements of certain groups with other parts of the world in general. Thus, for example, the Euro-African community at Osu is as much transnational as it is local because of the strong links that many of them continue to trace to the Richter, Wolf, Bannerman, Bergeson, Lutrot, Loco, Hansen, Engman, Quist, and various other families in Denmark to this day. Chapter two of Oxford Street, however, focused on the arrival in Accra in 1836 of a group of Afro-Brazilians. As I mentioned earlier, they were composed of 70 families and numbered about 200 people. There are several reasons why the Afro-Brazilians arrived in Accra and indeed in other parts of West Africa in the 1830s. Even though the Slave Abolition Act terminating the slave trade had been passed in 1807, the Slave Emancipation Act freeing all slaves was only passed for the British Empire in 1833. Not only that, the transatlantic slave trade continued well after the 1807 abolition. The British Royal Navy set up the West African Squadron, also known as Preventative Squadron, in 1808 with the explicit task of suppressing the residual transatlantic slave trade by patrolling the coast of West Africa. Even though by 1860, the squadron had captured 1,600 slave ships and freed upward of 150,000 slaves, historians argue that they were not very effective because of concerns the British had not to antagonize European allies that they were still active in the trade. For example, Portugal had been Britain's ally against the French in the then ongoing Napoleonic Wars of 1803 to 1815. And being the largest European slave trading nation made it difficult for the British to police them without antagonizing what was considered a crucial ally. In 1810, Britain signed a treaty with Portugal that allowed them to trade in slaves if they came exclusively from Portugal's own African possessions. That is from Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Capo Verde, Sao Tome and Principe, and Equatorial Guinea. This restriction was easily circumvented by the Portuguese so that they continued boldly in the slave trade well until the end of the century. At any rate, Portugal was to abolish the slave trade in their own country in 1836, but only much later in the colonies it held in Africa and the New World. 
It abolished the slave trade in its African colonies in 1869 and in Brazil not until 1888. Nevertheless, by the 1830s, British West Africa had gained the reputation of providing a safe haven for freed slaves, thus making it a very attractive destination for the Afro-Brazilians who arrived in Accra in 1836. Since Portugal had not signed on to the Emancipation Agreements of 1833, it meant that for a freed slave to go to Angola in 1836 meant running the risk of re-enslavement. An important reason for the arrival of the Afro-Brazilians in Accra, specifically in 1836, is also that there had been a major and ultimately unsuccessful slave rebellion in Bahia in 1835. What was called the Mali Rebellion also came to be associated with a largely Muslim rebellion. While many Hausas and Fulanis from the then already Islamicized northern Nigeria found themselves as slaves in Bahia, there was also a heavy preponderance of Yorubas who were referred to in Brazil by the umbrella term of Nagos. The bulk of slavery from today's Western Nigeria and Benin was generated by the expansionist jihads of Uthman Danfodio from 1804 to 1815. Uthman Danfodio's jihads were in turn to trigger crises in Yoruba land itself, especially in the rebellion and subsequent wars that were launched by the Are Onaka Kanfo Afunja from the military encampment of Ilorin in northern Oyo from 1817 to 1824. In the early 19th century, Ilorin was predominantly Yoruba but with a heavy Hausa Fulani presence and Afonja's troops were composed of Muslim slaves skilled in horse riding. The combination of Uthman and Fodio's jihads which were key to the formation of what was later to become the powerful Sokoto Caliphate, and Afunja's wars, which helped to consolidate the Emirate of Ilorin, were to lead to an upsurge of Yoruba and Muslim captives that ended up being sold in the slave port of the Kingdom of Dahomey, in what is today's Benin. Dahomey was populated by the Anago, who were also a Yoruba-speaking people, hence the generic name of Nago, by which all slaves from this part of the world were referred to in Brazil. Muslims in Bahia were called Mali at the time, which derives from the Yoruba word Imale, meaning a Yoruba Muslim. That's when scholars such as Lorand Matori and Jose Yao Reis point out that many of the Muslims of 19th century by year were Nagos. We must understand this as suggesting a complicated history of provenance that was essentially colored by the slaves' last port of departure from the ports of Dahomey. As Lauren Maturi has pointed out in Black Atlantic Religion, Tradition, Transnationalism, and Matriarchy in Afro-Brazilian Candomblé, as many as 8,000 manumitted slaves from Bahia returned to West Africa from 1822 to 1899, with many of these settling in colonial Lagos in Nigeria as well as in Accra, Freetown in Sierra Leone, Porto Novo in Dahomey, Benin. The administrative connections between Sierra Leone, the Gold Coast, and Lagos were to prove highly significant for the dynamic settlement patterns of returnee stranger groups 
from the New World to West Africa in the period, also raising significant implications about cosmopolitan hybridity and intercultural exchange beyond the Afro-Brazilians from the New World and the different West African communities they came to settle in. Indeed, the returnee Afro-Brazilians to Accra in the 19th century did know of their ilk and kin in Lagos and Porto Novo and actively sought to establish commercial and cultural networks with them. When the Afro-Brazilians arrived on the coast of Accra, they were inserted into a complicated political geography whose roots date back to the mid 17th century. It was the mid 17th century wars with hinterland groups that saw the indigenous Ga being fissured and reconstituted on the coast under the aegis of different European spheres of influence. The Dutch had built Fort Krivaker in 1649, later renamed Asher Fort at Asher Town, also known as Kinka, a cannon shot away from Fort James, which was itself put up by the English in 1672 in what was later to become Jamestown, but is also called by the alternative local name of Unleishi, which is a corruption of English. The Danes, on the other hand, established themselves much further eastward at Christian Bell Castle, itself taken over from the Swedes and completed in 1659 at Osu, where three and a half centuries later, Oxford Street was to flourish. The conjuncture of the dates of the establishment of European merchants' presence on the coast with the escalation of conflicts between the Ga and their neighbors in the 17th mid century is not entirely accidental, as it has been shown that the European presence heightened the need for military protection of hinterland trade routes to guarantee their continuing access to European merchandise on the coast. Strictly speaking, however, the Afro-Brazilians who were called Tabon shortly after their arrival reached Accra in three different stages between 1829 and 1836, with the arrivals of 1836 comprising the largest group and the ones that were to have the greatest impact among their hosts. The name Tabon derives from the form of greeting they exchange amongst themselves and with their host. Como esta? Esta bon? The numbers attributed to the 1836 group vary, but scholars are generally agreed that they were in the region of 200 persons and represented at least seven separate family groups. Given that the Mali Muslim slave rebellion had taken place in Bahia in 1835, and that the returnees constituted distinct family groups, it has been surmised that at least some, if not all, the Tabons of 1836 may have been deportees from that rebellion. The group in 1836 was led by Ni Azuma Nelson I and included the Viala or Vieira, Manuel, Gomez, Peregrino, Mahama Nassau, and Zuse families. Other Tabon names common in today's Accra and traceable to later arrivals are Ribeiro, Morton, Olympio, Nelson, Da Costa, Da Rocha, Fishian, Masiliano, and Da Silva. When the Afro-Brazilians arrived, they were given a warm reception by the Dutch Makelar or trade rep 
Kweku Ankara. Kweku Ankara was a freed Akan slave who rose to become one of the most successful traders in the period. And as the Dutch trade representative was a key figure in establishing relations between them and the people in both Accra and further inland. Kweku Ankara's reception of the Afro-Brazilians ensured that the Tambon were quickly extended special Dutch protection on their arrival. They were given large tracts of Dutch controlled lands at present day Asylum Down, Adabraka, Kukumblimli, and North Ridge, not long after their arrival, and on which they cultivated various vegetable crops, including tomatoes, potatoes, and okra, along with the staple cassava. This continued until the early part of the 20th century, when intense urban pressures forced the conversion of these lands from agrarian to urban uses. Places such as North Ridge in today's Accra have been vastly transformed from the agricultural lands they were in the mid 19th century. The area now houses the embassy of the Royal Republic of the Netherlands and the German and Swiss embassies, among others, and is also populated with Tabon and Dutch street names. Having left the continent originally as Africans, the returnees came back to West Africa as Portuguese-speaking Brazilians with multiple identities and indeed orientations. Pragmatism, as much as the quest for survival, was to see them forge a multi-tiered hybrid identity that aligned them on the one hand to Portuguese speaking trade networks that extended across the region and that also extended back as far as Brazil itself and on the other hand, to their host communities in Lagos, Porto Novo, and Accra. Portuguese traders had dominated commercial exchanges in West Africa from as early as 1471. And despite the fact that the Dutch and then the British had effectively displaced Portugal as a trading force by the 1650s, Portuguese pigeon remained the preferred trade lingua franca all across the West African coast well into the 19th century. The scholars Alcioni M. Amos and Ebenezer Ayesu have suggested in their essay, I am Brazilian, History of the Tabong Afro-Brazilians in Accra, that Kweku Ankara had a son named Antonio and a nephew called Pedro. And from this fact, speculate that he and other family members may have had contact with Brazilian women some time before the arrival of the 1836 cohort. The explanation that seems more likely and that Amos and Ayesu refer to only tangentially is that occupying the coveted position of Makela and thus being also the largest slave trader in the period, Kweku Ankara saw the Tabon as providing a golden opportunity for expanding his commercial networks. Aided by the common use of the Portuguese trade pigeon, by the mid 19th century, these networks involved trade across the Afro-Brazilian returnee communities in Lagos, Accra, and the various other places I have mentioned. And perhaps more importantly, between West Africa and the New World. Laurent Matori points out that there were dozens of ships and hundreds of free Africans traveling from Lagos to Bahia or through Bahia to Rio and Pernambuco 
between 1855 and 1898, and that as a transnational identity configuration and commercial endeavor existed among these groups long before transnationalism and globalization became the catchwords that they are today. Ankara himself was to recruit the Tabon as slave traders, but the more important point is that as the Makela, he must have seen in them the opportunity for establishing trade networks well beyond his usual circuits. The Tabon then represent complex and layered dimensions of recursive African diasporas, cultural hybridity, urban skill sets, and the necessary assimilation of stranger groups in the spatial formation of Accra. The building of Brazil House by Mama Nasu shortly after the Tabon's arrival in 1836 must also be taken as a manifest signifier of their spatial integration into local commercial and cultural networks, for it quickly became the center of their social and cultural life. Fully restored as a UNESCO heritage site in 2005, Brazil House's location on Brazil Lane between Asher Fort and James Fort directly overlooks the Old Harbor. As Mylin Loco points out in her architectural study of Brazil House, it was no accident that most of the houses built in that area had their backyards overlooking the Jamestown Harbor and their front verandas directly opening onto the busy Brazil Lane. Brazil Lane was a short distance from what was later to develop into the busy high street. Their location close to the harbor, the special gateway to the township that came to be progressively connected to the rest of the Gold Coast colony by a network of railways and roads toward the end of the 19th century, gave the Tabon many situational advantages and helped them consolidate their commercial networks from very early in their sojourn. Also, given the mixed land use dimensions of the areas close to the harbor, which comprised a mixture of large offices cum warehouses and residential units for both European merchants and the local population, Brazil Lane quickly became a prized community location for trade and later for the provision of accommodations and warehousing facilities to the many European entrepreneurs that dominated large-scale businesses in Accra in the period. The changes in the occupational character of Brazil House from roughly 1874 until the middle of the 20th century also speak to the social and economic transformations of the entire area and of the Afro-Brazilians place in it. The land and property values of the coastal strip that included Brazil House, Brazil Lane, and the areas close to the Asher and James Forts increased exponentially as the 19th century ended and the 20th century wore on, such that by mid 20th century, many of the more prosperous Tabon had leased their properties out to European businesses for use as offices and warehouses and had moved out to live on their lands at Adabraka, Kukumlimle, and elsewhere, as I mentioned earlier. In 1874, the original structure of Brazil House was torn down and rebuilt by Kofi Aqua, the eldest grandchild of Mama Nasu, who had trained as a chef in Wari, the bustling trade port in today's Western Nigeria. 
Aqua renamed the refurbished property Wari House in commemoration of his successful sojourn abroad and converted parts of the house into warehouses for rent to European businesses. This state of affairs was to remain in place until the 1940s, when on the departure of the last European tenants of Brazil House, Aqua's younger sister, Adelaide Aponsa, moved in with her family to establish a highly successful fishing enterprise. Caesar's House, another landmark Tabon building close to Asherford, was built by Aruna Nelson in 1854 and remained the center of Tabon tailor craft until it was destroyed by a fire in 1977. To this day, one of the most highly regarded tailors in Accra is Dan Morton, a direct descendant of the Mortons from the first generation of Tabons. As my local notes, the early Brazilian houses at Gamashi or Old Accra were built of stone with a design generally reminiscent of two-story buildings of Bahia. This fact requires us to revise certain observations made by Europeans about the general population and housing density of buildings in Accra during the 19th century. One of the really baffling questions that remains to be answered is what language the arriving Afro-Brazilians must have spoken with their hosts since they returned as thoroughly Portuguese speaking and presumably had completely forgotten any of the local languages they might have left with. The preferred trade language throughout the region, as I mentioned a moment ago at the time, was a Portuguese inflected pigeon. Even in its pigeon English variety to this day in Ghana and many parts of West Africa, there are many Portuguese loan words. And why is this? Well, the Portuguese were the first Europeans to arrive on the coast of West Africa as far back as 1471. In fact, Christopher Columbus made landfall in West Africa on his way to the Americas. At any rate, the Portuguese were to establish a number of trading outposts all across the region, stretching from Dakar and Senegal and through the then Gold Coast which is today's Ghana, and down to Angola, and even to the Cape in South Africa. In each of these trading outposts, the language that was spoken was a trade language composed of Portuguese and whatever local languages were to be found. The Portuguese dominance of trade throughout West Africa continued unabated until the 1650s when a strategic combination of English and Dutch piracy along with their own winning fortunes in Europe led to the progressive loss of Portuguese trading footholds. But not before a Portuguese inflected trade language became the lingua franca of the entire region such that by the time of the arrival of the Afro-Brazilians in Accra in 1836, the language that they heard had enough Portuguese in it for them to be able to understand their hosts and also to make themselves understood. If the Ga of 19th century Accra, when the Afro-Brazilians arrived, were focused predominantly on the occupational specializations of fishing, fish processing, salt making, and trade, the Tabon came to contribute early forms of urban livelihood diversification that were later to strongly resonate with the large numbers of migrants to arrive from other parts of the colony and West Africa.
Unlike merchant company artisanal slaves, such as cooks, carpenters, blacksmiths, etc., that work in the European forts and castles from the 17th century onwards, and whose allegiance was primarily to their masters, or the converts to early Christianity that fell under the aegis of the Basel mission, the Tabon had allegiance only to themselves as a distinct social cultural group forging a place within a completely new urban environment. They were adept at tailoring and dressmaking, extraordinarily talented at identifying sites for water wells, and were also really good agriculturalists and blacksmiths, all skills that they had acquired in their sojourn in Brazil. The Afro-Brazilians' early access to tracts of land, both close to the Jamestown Harbor and further inland in the growing township of Accra, also meant that they were quickly to occupy the upper entrepreneurial echelons of society, since they not only owned significant means of agricultural production, but also had the requisite skills to establish highly valued craft industries, such as tailoring and blacksmithing. The Tapon possessed skills that became increasingly significant for negotiating urban life. And given the circumstances under which they first arrived, also implied a significant resource for their integration into Ga society. By the 1930s, the burgeoning town was to be defined very much along the lines of urban skills represented by the Tabon, with the opportunities for working in the expanding colonial civil service, in the labor and building industries, and in commerce, fully altering the nature of urban assimilation of variant migrants to the town. Gradually, success in the town was no longer linked to the goodwill of either the European trading enterprises or to the indigenous Ga as collective owners of the lands where migrants sojourned. Furthermore, with greater urbanization, Accra was to become more and more dependent on agricultural produce from various areas, also shifting the nature of the networks that were to feed the growing township. Today, the area around Brazil House and Old Accra, near James Fort and Asher Fort, is the location of the annual Chale Wate Festival, which brings together tens of thousands of tourists and travelers in August from all over the world to view street art, sample different kinds of local cultural products, and otherwise participate in the lively carnivalesque atmosphere to be had during the festival. Many visitors go through the refurbished but now wears for wear Brazil house, and in this way become unwitting participants in a long transnational journey that started in Africa, was routed through the fields of Bahia, and returned via many tribulations back to Accra. It is an unremarked aspect of transnational cosmopolitanism that the city exemplifies in many of its features. Thank you very much. Please remember to check the reading suggestions in the episode description. And if you like this episode, give a thumbs up, subscribe and share, hit the notifications button 
so that you do not miss out on any upcoming episodes and enter your comments in the section below. See you next week. Thank you.